So today we're going to be taking a look at a scenario where China and Japan go to war. Now these two countries have a very bitter history with both China and Japan having a lot of wars between each other, especially in World War II we saw Japan attacking China and Korea, so this war is going to have a lot of meaning. Now China is the third strongest, maybe second strongest country in the world, Japan is at number five, so both countries are fairly strong. So what's going to happen when they go to war with each other? We also have to factor in allies like China's ally of Pakistan or the Japan's ally of the United States. And overall, this scenario is going to be very interesting. So if you do enjoy it, make sure to leave a like on this video and subscribe to the channel if you're brand new. We are aiming for 100,000 subscribers by the end of this year. So we have around a month to go. We have 18,000 subscribers to go. 18,000 subscribers in one month would break a record, but it's the end of the year, and you know, the goal is there, so let's try to hit it. If you're already subscribed, try to share this video with people who aren't subscribed and get them to subscribe, and if you've been watching my videos and you aren't subscribed, what are you doing? Anyway, let's go ahead and jump right into this video. Now, I'm not exactly sure how this war would break out. We could have Japan declaring war on China, which is extremely unlikely, and also, I think, impossible. I don't think Japan has the capability of declaring war because of their constitution, but just for the sake of things, and for the sake of some realism, we're going to have China declare war on Japan. Now, this itself is going to shock the world due to the economies of these two countries. China is a ma major exporter, as well as Japan, so uh, the world is really going to feel this war. But of course, we can't just have these two countries go in the war with each other and not have anyone else get involved that's extremely unlikely and unrealistic so let's go ahead and throw in some allies first of all taiwan joins in on japan's side i'm sure this would be the breaking point for them because you know china taiwan big problem there uh, looks like China is attacking your ally, Japan. Might as well jump in and help out if you can. I'm sure that Taiwan would serve more as a distraction as opposed to an actual like contributor. But there is still some more allies to include, such as China's ally of North Korea and their ally of Pakistan. For Japan, we're going to go ahead and throw in South Korea. And of course, we can't ignore the good old United States of America. Uh, China, Pakistan, and North Korea versus South Korea, Japan, the US, and Taiwan. I feel like these would be the base countries. I think we could probably subtract out Pakistan and maybe the Koreas if this war to, were to actually happen but i know that china japan and taiwan as well as the us those would be major uh powers and contributors in this war they would 100 percent get involved if some kind of war broke out between china and japan well that's enough talking let's go ahead and get into the fighting now of course navy is going to be a huge factor in this war so i've gone ahead and drawn in the naval occupation zones but going straight to the ground game we have nothing happening on the Korean border, and this is because South Korea has put up a well thought out and effective defense. Now, of course, China and North Korea are loading up to push past said defense, but for now, South Korea is able to hold out. Meanwhile, the Japanese and American navies make pushes down south to kind of, I guess, establish complete control over these Japanese islands. Um, obviously, they already have control of them, but they, the navy wasn't actively using them. Now the navy is actively using them and it just looks better on the map. With this, we have a navy link between Japan and Taiwan, which allows for them to supply Taiwan. However, there is a problem, and that is the Chinese navy, who instantly pushes in and captures all the water around Taiwan. With this, Taiwan is pretty much isolated, and the blue team navy is unable to push into the water surrounding the island. Now, the Chinese navy is something that is very interesting. It's not necessarily the most powerful that would go to the US, but there is a lot of ships within the navy. Um, said ships maybe not of the best quality and that's why it's at number two navy still it's just quantity over quality at this point in the war so china is able to take over the waters around taiwan with this we have a couple attempted landings now there are some uh, u.s and japanese troops on this island from when the navy was linked up with it those guys have remained there and of course they're unable to leave because of china's supremacy in the area so they are left to fight with the taiwanese in protecting taiwan two major landings are made on taiwan both gaining a lot of ground but at this point in the war taiwan is holding out as China makes slow advances. It has now become Japan and the blue team's uh, first priority to kind of save Taiwan. Of course, as I've already said, Taiwan is serving as a distraction, but still, they have the export factor for them. Much like China and uh, Japan, Taiwan exports a lot of things to Western countries like the United States with the chip manufacturing. So of course, this is already going to further disrupt their already disrupted economy. So now we have Japan and the US creating a larger naval front between the red and blue teams. And it is here that we start to see quality over quantity as the US and Japan push into Chinese waters. They pretty much line the coast, but are more focused on capturing the northern coast of Taiwan in which they do so successfully. With this, they are able to do the evacuations from taipei but also are able to reinforce taipei at this point down south though china is capturing more and more of the island as only the northern part of the island remains which is still being supplied by the blue team further down south we have china expanding its naval authority over here in the south china sea while also thickening up the front against the blue team navy in the south
south. They actually managed to do some successful campaigns and managed to take over some of these Japanese isles before being stopped by the blue team. But shifting focuses real quick, we have an event taking place up north along the Korean border. And it is just in that the North Korean army and the Chinese army have successfully pushed back South Korean defenses and are now entering into mainland South Korea. It's not at an alarming rate, but it's at a rate which you might want to think about maybe pulling some assets from Taiwan and refocusing them on the much more, I guess, strategically and like more beneficial country. I think if Japan had to choose between losing Taiwan or Korea, I think they would rather lose Taiwan. I mean, of course you don't want to lose an ally, but in terms of who's more beneficial, South Korea is way more beneficial. I mean, you don't even recognize Taiwan, so what's the point? But nonetheless, the red team is pushing into South Korea, whereas the blue team is starting to push back in Taiwan. We see them having a successful campaign down south of the isle. However, they're not able to advance much further due to the Chinese naval supremacy on the outskirts of the island. So now they uh, start to focus on something else, which is complete naval superiority. They capture the remaining bit of the sea up here, which hasn't been claimed by anyone. Technically, it's still unclaimed, but they have more boats in there and there isn't any Chinese boats past this red line. So I guess you can kind of say that it's gone to the blue team. But at this point, we do have some countries making some statements about this whole event. India has reluctantly said that they will remain neutral in this war simply due to the effects of it on its people and economy would not be enough. I mean, of course, they want to go up against Pakistan and China, their two biggest rivals, but it's just not worth it. I mean, of course, they would have the advantage since the US is on their side. But if you think about it like geographically, India is kind of isolated away. Of course, America is just one ocean away, but they're kind of in, you know, they have to go through this straight right here if the US wanted to get over to them. And honestly, I don't know if it's worth joining the war. So they're going to stay out. We also have Chinese allies saying that they're going to stay out of this war. Such allies include Iran, also Russia, who I don't think would want to join this war in real life. It would just be a complete mess if they did because the NATO would get involved. That's a world war. Nobody wants that. But yeah, so Chinese allies kind of don't want to join in on this war. I think Kyrgyzstan probably could, but they wouldn't contribute much. So maybe they wouldn't. As for Southeast Asia, they could be forced in. But once again, they wouldn't contribute much. So there is no point. As for Japanese allies, though, we do have some joining in. And those allies include Australia and New Zealand. Of course, these guys are going to contribute a little bit, but nothing too major especially from New Zealand, who I don't even know anything about New Zealand's military. If any, I think they might share a military with Australia. I'm not 100% sure on that, though. But finally, we go down to the Philippines, the last remaining Japanese ally in this area. Of course, there are more, but major and war-joinable allies. I think the Philippines would probably be the last that I have been discussed yet. And uh, they're going to stay out of this war, simply because, once again, kind of similar to India, I mean, they could benefit from this in some weird way. I know the Philippines have a lot of disputes with China, especially around the South China Sea. But overall, they don't see the benefits, so they stay out. So with extra help from Australia and New Zealand in this war, Japan and the blue team are going to be having a much more fun time against China and North Korea. Down south in the Taiwan area, we have the blue team navy pushing back the Chinese navy. So much so that China completely loses all naval waters around Taiwan and are forced back to their coast. This effectively causes the collapse of the Chinese front in Taiwan, and Taiwan is saved by Japan in the blue team. Going up north though, it isn't going so well for the blue team as South Korea is getting invaded by North Korea and China. A majority of China's military assets are pushing into South Korea and this is probably for a good reason as they just want to knock them out of the war. We have them encircling the Seoul area which is a little bit more north I think but that's close enough. And from here they use their navy to effectively cut off Seoul for the rest of South Korea and the blue team. This is uh, concerning to Japan because obviously South Korea is a major ally and they don't want to lose them so they start to ship even more reinforcements and equipment into South Korea. Also, I'm sorry if my voice sounds weird. I've been like going through a weird cold or I don't know. It's weird. I just like it's like allergies and cold mixed together. It's horrible, but um, I'm getting over it now. So we're all good. Also, I'm really sorry for not posting a video last Saturday. I, if you saw the community post, you'll know why. I just really wasn't feeling up to it like sick wise, but also because I wasn't sure what to record. I literally came up with this video idea five seconds before I hit record. So that's probably not a good thing, but hey, we're here now and I have a good feeling about this video. So who cares? But as long as you guys are somewhat enjoying the content or you're watching it or, you know, just as long as you're enjoying it, I'm happy. Obviously, I can't satisfy everyone, but I try my best to. Well, also considering my mental health and stuff like that. So, hey, we're here. Let's continue with the video. So now the blue team is once again going to change their strategy. Before, it was, you know, saving Taiwan, and then the South Korea got invaded. So now it's saving South Korea, but it's not really working. Uh, all of China and North Korea are 
focusing on capturing in South Korea and taking over that, you know, if they do that, they'll be at a pretty good point. You know, you just uh, protect South Korea navally, and then once you do that, you can probably stalemate out the blue team or even try to maybe push into Taiwan and retake that and get a peace treaty. So they are dead set on capturing South Korea. And that's what the only thing they're doing. But that's also their weakness. If they're focusing a majority of their assets on South Korea, they're going to leave some holes along the Chinese coast. And of course, they're still going to be def uh, defending this Chinese coast. I'm not saying that all of China is in South Korea. I'd say like maybe like 50% of their military is in South Korea. The other 50% is on defense. But if you look over here, a naval invasion of Pakistan is extremely unlikely. So I would say like maybe 80% of Pakistan's military is over here working in North Korea. North Korea, of course, is using 100%. And then, you know, we look at the blue team. So Japan, they're using probably like 60% uh, of their military in South Korea. Now, of course, I'm not counting like reserves and other like branches. I'm talking about like military personnel. Where are they sending it? Not like the actual military and all of its equipment and stuff. If that makes sense, it probably doesn't because I'm not very good at explaining things. Japan, 60%. Taiwan, they're all in defense. So 100% is down here in Taiwan. And then we look at Australia, they're probably sending up like 70%, New Zealand, if any, maybe like 60, 70%. And then the US, of course, they're going to be defending themselves, but they're also going to be sending probably over a majority of their military over there. But the point I'm trying to make here is that the red team is heavily focused on North Korea. Uh, there's still some available assets, but all of it is in North Korea, pushing into South Korea. This is why they've been able to push in so effectively. But once again, there is that hole, and that hole is the lack of defense on the Chinese coast. So the blue team strategizes invading China as opposed to saving South Korea. Of course, they're still going to try to save South Korea, but it would be more beneficial for them at this very point in time to just invade China and try to get them out of South Korea. So the blue team Navy makes a full force effort to push along into the Chinese coast, and this goes extremely well. Uh, many professionals and many uh, military strategists said that this was a horrible idea uh, and it on paper it probably was considering that you're just going full force with your navy and uh, they, they managed to do it they captured the chinese coastal waters and effectively cut the chinese navy into two areas now this does have its downfalls such as china being able to push even further from the yellow sea over here so they go down even more so overall this push has been effective for the blue team they've gotten to the chinese coast and now they're going to attempt to invade and invade they do except it's in an awkward spot so you know they they have the coast of hong kong right here so they take advantage of that they invade hong kong or they i guess capture it hong kong is a kind of weird part of china it's not technically it's not a part of china fully but it is also a part of china it's autonomous i don't know but they take over hong kong with open arms and from here they push into the mainland of china pushing over and capturing macau and now seeing this china is withdrawing some of its forces from south korea who actually have just taken over seoul so i mean good for you but also you just kind of left south korea a little bit of course pakistan is going to resend some forces on the china you know china is the more important country in this war and with this surprise invasion they really weren't expecting it now there is one area here that the uh, blue team is going to struggle in and that is actually going to be navy the red team navy actually manages to push back and then with naval boats in this area they start to bomb the areas that the blue team has taken over good old communist values here you know blowing up your own country kind of like a scorched earth thing but this overall weakens the blue team offensive down here and it eventually starts to fizzle out it's split into two and eventually the left side collapses while the right side starts to kind of retreat back to hong kong until eventually there is a stalemate established there and no one is pushing in but also no one is pushing out with this we jump back up to south korea where the Japanese and allies are now pushing back the red team. With China's grand pullout of South Korea, we have the blue team taking advantage of a very not organized North Korea, pushing them all the way back to their border. It does take a few weeks, but they do eventually leak into the country, and now it's time for China to rethink their recent decision. And that is exactly what they do, except they kind of split it up a little bit differently. Instead of like pushing 50% over towards North Korea, they kind of go for a more like 40 35 percent over the north korea while also going on defense along their coast so while the blue team does strive and even captures pyongyang they are eventually slowed down and stalemated and there is no gain on either side now it's time for war crimes as the blue team starts to bomb every little naval facility along the chinese coast and china does the exact same thing along the south korean coast so Everyone's bombing everyone. War crime here, war crime there. Everyone's doing a war crime. Even the old dude who survived Nagasaki and doesn't know what's happening, he is doing war crimes. The neighborhood cat, war crimes. At this point, the international community, which which actually two of the international community leaders are fighting, so I'm not really sure what influence the international community might have, but they're basically saying, stop, this is stupid. 
no one's gaining anything from this and the two sides start to kind of agree except for china who never agrees with anyone on the west they try to do a full-on naval offensive here that goes horribly and they're immediately met with a blue team naval offensive which was very surprising as they didn't even plan to do this china tries to do the exact same thing in the south except this time it actually works whatever navy north korea had is now gone the sea of japan turns blue well, I mean, it was already blue, but you know what I mean. With everything going great for the blue team here, it's hard to believe that they would start to lose land in North Korea. And that's exactly what they do as the Chinese re-push into the claims that they already had. The only difference this time is that the blue team does have naval control along a majority of the coast in North Korea. So those Chinese troops are met with a lot of naval bombardments until eventually the two sides decide to meet for peace. That's right, this war will not have a winner. It is going to be basically one giant stalemate. So let's go ahead and take a look at this peace treaty. All right, the only land change is that South Korea gains land in North Korea. Only a little slither, but it does move the DMZ back a few kilometers. But there are some international policies and in-between country policies that have been created. First of all, there is a quad quadruple pact well actually it would be quintuple pact between the u.s japan south korea taiwan and australia the u.s south korea japan and australia have actually gone ahead and recognized taiwan as independent even though china still kind of says no to that but at this point the world is hurting from the economical impacts of this war so and in the coming years we have other countries starting to recognize taiwan without consequence until eventually i'd say around two-thirds of the world maybe 50% of the world recognizes the country. That's kind of an unintentional impact of this war. But uh, now we're going over to Japan, who is, of course, the main star of the blue team in this war. They don't really do much in terms of policy. There are some mutual agreements made with China along this area of water, and, you know, concerning trade. Of course, Japan needs to use this to trade with Taiwan. China recognizes that, of course, without recognizing Taiwan as a country. So there are some more friendly initiatives taken to maybe prevent another war like this to taking place in the future. As for North Korea, they're basically screwed. Um, China doesn't really see a point in protecting them anymore. They're not a very viable ally. So, you know, in the future, we could maybe just see this line disappear now there is still a way for war in the future and that involves the south china sea as there was no resolve around this area as the philippines didn't even get involved vietnam didn't get involved so this area still a little bit troublesome for china and the west or more specifically the philippines and now there's probably going to be another war based around it the south china sea war that would be interesting but that is going to do it for today's video like i said we are aiming for 100,000 subscribers by the end of this year, we have one month to do it. This video actually goes live on the 30th. So the last day of November, you'll see this video, which means we have exactly 31 days to get 100,000 subscribers or get to 100,000. We're not going to get 100K in a month. That would be amazing if we did, but that's literally impossible. So we're going to try to, uh, you know, narrow that down and just get 17.8 thousand subscribers. Is it possible? I don't know. Tell your friends and families to go subscribe. Do not make alternative accounts though, because that is cheating. That is uh, not authentic. And also YouTube just removes those accounts. So there's really no point in doing that. Get real people who are interested in the content, friends, family, co co-workers, maybe not co-workers, but like alumni in school, anyone, get your dog to subscribe to this channel. We are gonna try our best to get to 100K and it all starts with you. Of course, I have to make the videos, but I need you guys to show some support. That's probably my biggest spiel on subscribing, so there's that. But of course, also liking the video, sharing, commenting, those all help the channel as well. Subscribing is the main thing, of course, with the 100K goal, but any form of support really helps us out. So that's gonna do it for the whole begging for support segment. Once again, thank you guys for watching this video and I'll see you guys in the next video.